all of you for coming. I must say I'm a little bit nervous about interviewing such uh, young, high achievers at this stage that uh, when, you, when I read through their CVs and what they've managed to achieve and the passion that they've put into it in such a short space of time, it's one of those exact, one of those situations where I start to feel increasingly humble, which I, I do on quite regularly. Um, I'm very interested in the topic of social entrepreneurship and social enterprise. My, my personal background is I'm, I'm far more boring. I'm an accountant um, and, and an auditor at that, really. But um, I, I have had a reasonably interesting journey myself uh, working in some entrepreneurial companies. I did an MBA a number of years ago and uh, thought I was going to change the world and thought, right, that um, I can be an entrepreneur and I can make a difference. And I, I, I discovered through that process and through working with a couple of spectacular failures through the dot-com era, that um, I'm very good with the ideas and the strategy piece and working with people and I'm very, very bad at actually maintaining that motivation and maintaining that implementation and pushing through. So from that experience, I have a lot of admiration for people who persevere with their ideas when others are telling them crazy and in particular for social entrepreneurs where there's only, no, I shouldn't say only, but the payoff is far more altruistic than, uh, than uh, in the hip pocket. Um, maintaining that drive and that mo m momentum and, and passion as well. So uh, I'm also very much of the view that uh, entrepreneurial organisations have a lot to teach big business and the big end of town. And uh, have working for a large organisation myself and, and dealing with a lot of our large organisations, they uh, can often be very complacent. We're big, we're large, we've been here for a long time, we know best, we, we know how to do it, and can often be very, very patronising towards smaller organisations. I think the groundswell is shifting slightly, and there's a recognition now that a lot of the best policy ideas and initiatives um, in a public sense, and a lot of the uh, innovation of new products and directions for larger organisations is increasingly coming out of entrepreneurial companies and uh, increasingly so also in the social space. And uh, as we have at least one example up here tonight with uh, Tom Organic, it can demonstrate that both the social purpose and the for-profit for purpose increasingly have opportunities to merge together as well. And uh, I'd like to believe that that's the future of many of our organisations that become far more integrated in their social and sustainable purposes, integrated into the proper business model. But that's enough about me for the moment. Format tonight is I'll let each of our panellists introduce themselves. Um, they've got their opportunity now for the initially a free plug for the organisation or in some instances organisations that they represent. Uh, but not just wanting them to talk about their organisations and what it's about, but also talk a little bit about their own background and what led them to their idea. Elliot Costello, YGAP is the uh, organisation that was top of your list for, for talking tonight. Would you like to introduce yourself and a little bit about yeah, sure. YGAP and its direction and history and yours? Yeah, sure. I'm probably a good place to start, Melissa, because I, once upon a time, was an auditor too. Oh. And uh, <laughs> before committing suicide, I decided to quit. <laughs> I've done that three times, I'm a sucker for punishment, I've done that three times. I'm very amazed and surprised it's still involved. It's good to see you integrating your skill and passion with uh, social enterprises. Um, well, concurrently, whilst at Bicewaterhouse Coopers and uh, even prior to starting, I and a group of friends elected to uh, spend our sort of summer break in Africa and um, by virtue of just looking into other, other volunteer organisations, we just came across exorbitant um, administration fees attached to volunteering. and. You know, as mid twenties, young twenties, we thought, well, rather than submitting five to seven to eight thousand dollars to go volunteer overseas, that money can be better spent. So, um, we put our sort of thinking caps on and decided to partner up with small NGOs in the field. And uh, to cut a long story short, decided to go our own way and be a fundraising arm for two groups that we partnered up with: one in Malawi and uh, one in Ghana. And the snowball effect was from that moment on. We needed a bank account. We needed a name. We needed a website. We needed everything that follows from that. So it wasn't a direct vision where YGAP sort of set out and said this is our market space and this is what we're going to do, but it's more a reaction to the, um, the reality that it costs a lot of money to volunteer. So in the space of uh, a few months in late 2008, we raised $132,000 through running events and talking to corporates and selling a vision that we're going over to uh, undertake these two development projects in Malawi and Ghana. Upon returning uh, early 2009, we just had a flight of friends and networks and university colleagues that were like, hey, that's pretty cool. I've always wanted to volunteer. I've never really found an angle. I've never really been involved with the social organisation. How do I do something? How do I make a change? And we were like, oh, shit, hold on. We weren't planning to do too much. So then we had to go back to the drawing board and, and really think about what is YGAP and what we're going to take it to be. So um, as opposed to you know, sending floods of volunteers overseas, obviously there's a environmental impact of doing so. 
and um, it's not cost effective, we decided to launch a series of initiatives here in Melbourne, um, which have now spread across Australia, a series of initiatives that provide volunteers an avenue to get involved with international development um, through practical and creative sort of um, enterprises and um, projects. So why got today stands is a, a volunteer organisation built around creative and innovative fundraising initiatives um, and what has spurned off um, from YGAP has been our Kinfo Cafe, um, some of you may know it but for the benefit of those that don't, um, using our entrepreneurial skills, using our passion for integrating our business skills with also this social vision, um, we took on a project which was larger than life, unfortunately at that time we didn't have a board because they definitely would have said no, we had no equipment, we had no money, um, we had limited obviously no licenses and limited hospitality experience but uh, a group of friends and I opened Kimfo Cafe on Burke Street and uh, just a few months ago it got rated as the top 10 cafes in Melbourne CBD and then top 30 in the whole across Melbourne um, and obviously Melbourne is a very competitive cafe culture so that was the power of that vision and uh, in 16 months of operation we've turned over $600,000 through that cafe and provided $80,000 of development relief to our project partners um, so there's that integration between that vision and that business skill. Um, so our, as YGAP continues, our, our core purpose has been to not reinvent the fundraising wheel, um, but in that sense really look at it from a different angle and say, all right, so we are young and YGAP stands for an acronym, which is Y Generation Against Poverty. So we're trying to leverage that Y Generation uh, energy and enthusiasm for creating social change and, and do it in a really innovative way. Um, so be it social enterprising um, and be it sort of events. and extreme sports, everything else we've taken on has been a sort of way to leverage that want and need for volunteers to get involved with the project with all that, also that business and social skill. So you're really giving opportunity for volunteers to volunteer locally in something that raises funds for volunteers to go overseas to volunteer on other mm. projects. Yeah, yeah. volunteer <laughs> things in heaven, yeah. Spreading it out in the... Yes. yes. Yeah. So which have you found hardest if you uh, compare raising funds directly to support the volunteers that you was initially planning to send to some of the development projects versus uh, setting up and running a social enterprise to try and provide that stream of funding as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, the initial year was probably the easiest year because you're selling a vision from your heart and yep. it was so brand new and you had so many family and friends and um, those connected to your network that wanted to get involved and support you. Um, but sustaining that's the next challenge and that has been the challenge. But we've uh, just rolled into our fourth year, so um, it is that leg that's probably the hardest. But we opened the cafe and it wasn't a matter of fundraising um, per se. Uh, we opened the cafe for $14,000. Um, most cafes cost between $120,000 dollars and $150,000 of startup capital um, by virtue of donated labour, donated volunteer hours, um, donated equipment, um, selling that vision to our suppliers. We basically opened that cafe from building it from scratch for $14,000 um, which obviously cut that overhead and we could turn a profit within the first few months. So for a social business, um, we looked at that as more of an investment made on a few people's behalf. Um, as opposed to a fundraising initiative because it's built on a, a social business premise where we pay tax and uh, we pay our employees and we run it as a business and we compete against the other cafes um, in the local area. So it's using market-based solutions to, to drive that social change. Um, but our challenge remains now that in the charity arm, we are employing one person, given it we're three years in, four years in, um, to fundraise for her, for her role and to make sure that there's money on that behalf to pay those administration fees um, to continue our projects to you know, continue funding our international outcomes. Mm -hmm. well, we'll come back a little bit later to uh, what the future might look like in a few of the directions and, and, and that type of thing. Uh, on our far right uh, we have Kumari Middleton and I did check with Kumari before we started on the correct pronunciation of Mayubaya. No. But Maya Buya. <laughs> there we go. Maya So, uh, um, very, very different background of, of organisation, I think, to, to YGAP. Um, and I was very intrigued to, uh, with Kamari, has a professional dance background and uh, a personal background that's given her a passion, I think, in supporting and furthering uh, youth, youth at risk. Um, in not just in Australia, but in particular, in particular overseas in a couple of markets, and uh, interested in learning more about Kamari's journey of marrying her personal and professional passion, which is obviously dancing, yeah. with a uh, social enterprise which uh, ties that in with youth at risk and empowers them to make differences in their lives. So, Kamari, would you like to share a little bit more about your journey and background? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I run an organisation called Mayabuya, and we use performing arts to work with 
young people living in disadvantaged um, communities. So um, we started about two years ago and <laughs> um, in South Africa. Um, so we have projects in South Africa. We launched last year in Australia and at the end of this year we're moving into Cambodia as well. Um, we're very grassroots um, and yet to be really businessy and raising lots of money. So we work on a tiny, tiny budget and um, get venues donated and teachers donated or volunteering. Um, yeah, so I guess my journey is that I did I was a professional dancer um, and that was my life and that's what I thought would be my life for a very long time. Um, and I was performing in New York and I got Legionnaires, which is um, a condition that affects the lungs. So I now lo no longer can dance professionally. I can teach a bit now. It took me um, about a year to be able to walk to the end of my street and back, um, just not being able to breathe. Uh, so I guess that made me reevaluate where I was going and what would be my passion moving forward. Um, and dance is what I know and working with young people is what I know, so that's how I was able to combine those to bring dance and performing arts to other young people who don't have the opportunities um, to participate in that. And yeah, it allows us to um, build confidence and bring people together from different cultures um, and also allows young people to tell their stories. Uh, and can educate communities, communities that wouldn't um, normally listen to lectures about different issues. We can use performing arts as a tool to spread messages about um, different things that they're facing. So, Where was the very first project that you started and what were the origins of it? And uh, when did you think that something that you might have been trialling or airing or playing with might be bigger than just a one-off project and how has that journey progressed? Sure. In 2008 I was volunteering for the Oak Tree Foundation and um, they brought over some South Africans and one of the guys there came up to me and said, hey, you know, you're a dance teacher, please can you come to South Africa and teach our kids, like dance is such an integral part of their culture. Um, and at the time I was still sick so I was like, you know, that's not going to work right now but um, you know, maybe we could fundraise from Australia and take over funds to make this a reality. And so that was the initial idea and it's just grown into being far more than a fundraising arm. Um, and we, when we started, we got a lot of people saying it wasn't possible, you won't be able to do it, you don't know what you're talking about. So um, they said, you know, come up with a pilot, run a pilot and see whether this even works. And you know, you can use that moving forward to prove that what you're trying to do, you know, can make a difference. So we took over a group of Australians to South Africa um, and ran um, a camp with about 40 young people just to test, you know, could these gangster Zulu guys learn ballet or um, could, <laughs> and they did, they did. Um, and could the cultures all work well together? Um, so that, I think, was the first time. and. Being over there and realising everything we were achieving and how much it was uplifting communities and how, yeah, just everything we had seen in the future was, you know, making this difference and could be far bigger than we had ever expected. So how did you fund that trip? Because for that would have been a sizable enough taking a team of you over at that stage for a pilot that's on the other yeah. side of the world and convincing somebody here that, yes, we're just going to do a pilot first and by the way, can you fund us over there where you can't actually see what we're doing? Yeah. How did you go about that? Um, Henna tattoos. So <laughs> we um, went to heaps and heaps of festivals and did henna tattoos and would raise like um, 3,000 in a weekend. Um, so we did that a lot. Um, and then we ran some dance workshops here at dance schools where yes. the students would pay to do holiday um, classes mm -hmm. um, and we would get teachers to volunteer their time so it cost us nothing and that also allowed us to fundraise those costs. Was that all done with a visible purpose that that's where the funds were oh, yeah. going to go towards? Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what did you learn out of the pilot? What's happened since um, that's different perhaps to what you thought might happen in the beginning? I think um, we are definitely around how you run things and putting the policies and things in place beforehand. Like we were very naive and we were just like, you know, we're going to go over and everything will be fine. But there's so much around the culture and as someone who's running an organisation, you assume that everyone sort of is aligned and has the same values, but um, people can act in different ways that you don't expect. So there was just a lot about how we now train volunteers to go into different communities and, you know, being able to respect the culture and that sort of thing. Um, so it was a really good, 
yeah, learning experience mm -hmm. to start at the very beginning and go forward and be able to have the processes in place. Yeah. And at what stage did you start to think of yourselves as an organisation as distinct from a bunch of people that have got a really good idea and projecting really getting a big buzz out of helping somebody through a particular pilot, when did you actually shift in your mind to say, right, we've done this once, we've got something that we think we can replicate and do again? Has that evolved as well, or was there a point in time where you needed to harness a team around you to say, right, are we committed to this from an organisation perspective? Just interested in that we transition. We probably went the other way, actually, and you know started the organisation before we'd even started the project yes. and it worked. Um, so we just you know got the advice of you know you have to do this and this. So we just did it. We went and registered. We started, and we had this organisation. We hadn't actually done anything, yeah, done anything yet. yet. So I think we went the other way. And would you do anything um, differently yeah. in that sense? Structure-wise, you'll find now from. Oh, I what mean, you need, I have or? learned so much in the last two years that I would do everything yeah. differently. Yeah. But um, I, we wouldn't have got to where we are if we yes. hadn't have done the way that we went about things. I don't think, and I wouldn't have had the learnings that I have now. So. I think I was talking to someone the other day who said, "Yes, I'd do everything differently, but I wouldn't change a thing." <laughs> and that sort of sums it up really in some ways. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Kamari. Uh, Nick, to my left, we have Nick, Nick Aladis. I've probably got that. Close. Close enough as well mm -hmm. on my left. Now, I've got a list of four or five things on my page, Nick, that you're involved in, and I wasn't quite sure what hat you might be wearing today, so I'll let you maybe describe as much or as little as you like about um, that Nick was the co-founder of the Live, Live Below the Line um, campaign, I suppose is probably the best way to describe that. He's also the Australian Director of Change.org. Um, currently, or has previously been previously, Victor, previously been Vic director of Oak Tree Foundation as well, and currently a head of non-executive director of Ausgreen, and also the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, and also the Australian Youth <laughs> Climate Coalition. Um, so there you go. I'm missing, missing yeah. that one on the list. I'll have to. And he hasn't slept for three years. <laughs> and and underli underline all of this, I think I've got equals busy with underlines, and at that point I was feeling very exhausted before I even started. So um, where do each of those fit in your life and what has been your journey to that and uh, how do you decide who you are at any point in time? Or do you have a view that it all sits behind a singular plan or vision or idea of, of, of who you are and what you want to be? Yeah, so I, um, I've always been someone who's very passionate about social issues and um, have I guess been, I guess all the decisions I make I kind of look through the lens of you know, where can I be right now that's going to allow me to have the biggest impact on the things that I care about um, and that kind of changes as my skills develop, as the opportunities change and, and that kind of thing. Um, so you know, for a number of years I kind of volunteered in various organisations, um, mostly with the Oak Tree Foundation and, um, and kind of a few other environmental NGOs. It was in uh, it was, about, it was just over two years ago today, actually, um, around today, that um, me and a good friend of mine, um, we were living together and uh, we were kind of despairing over the fact that uh, as people who are really passionate about the issue of global poverty, we found it really hard to actually communicate with people what that actually meant in a really kind of emotive way that people really felt at the kind of core of their soul. Uh, it's like one thing to say, yeah, there are 1.4 billion people living in extreme poverty on less than $1.25 a day. Um, but what does that actually mean? And you know, as someone, I'm I'm very interested about what does it take to, I guess, engage people around the issue in a really deep way, in a way that sees them want to dedicate their life to it, in a way that sees them want to um, change the way that they engage with the issue. And it was really kind of starting from the perspective of, well, if I only feel like I understand it at the most academic level, um, then how can I expect other people to even kind of go anywhere beyond that? Um, and so it was at that time that me and my friend Rich, um, we were living together, we were having a few beers out the back of my house, and uh, we were like, well, you know, let's give it a try. <laughs> um, let's see what it's actually like. And obviously you can't replicate it in full, but over the coming weeks we gave it a try of what does it actually look like to live on um, US dollar twenty-five a day. Um, a few months went by after that experience, and it was a really eye-opening experience, and I guess it had just been kind of you know, sitting at the back of the head uh, and um, really it kind of started to emerge that this was an opportunity to provide a really substantial number of people with an insight into what extreme poverty was actually like. Um, and so we kind of came up with the idea that actually let's turn this into an initiative in and of itself. Um, that was kind of at the end of 2009. Um, we actually didn't get to we didn't kind of properly try and launch it until uh, the end of May. Oh, that, we started working on it at the end of May in 2010. 
um, with the goal to kind of get as many people as possible doing the Live Below the Line challenge. At the time, we hadn't branded it, we hadn't named it, we didn't have anything. Um, and uh, we launched it on the 1st of June and then it um, kind of ran for the first time on August 2nd to 6th. Um, and we had two, uh, just around 2,000 people take part um, and raised $520,000. Um, and that's for the launch the very first time. Yeah, it was like six weeks after we kind of started, you know, it was, it was pretty full on time. Um, and so, and then um, after that, uh, you know, it was like, well, I, I really felt like, because we, we, it had been so scrappy the first time we did it, it was very much like thrown together on like no budget with like no capacity, no thinking, everything was just thrown together at the last minute. And um, it was like, well, actually this can be so much more. Um, and so, um, uh, by that time, Rich had kind of gone off to um, uh, go and work for other incredible organisations um, and we were looking and I was thinking about well, what's it going to look like the next year. So we repositioned it and said actually we want it to be in May rather than August and so less than nine months later we ran it again and, um, and that time uh, we had um, just under 7,000 people take part and raised $1.5 million uh, and that was in May this year uh, and uh, so that was kind of cool. Uh, the moment we had like everyone kind of all the volunteers who'd been working on it kind of sitting around as we watched the counter go up towards a million. Um, we've got that on camera, which was really cool. So um, yeah, so and and I guess the other thing that I wanted to add in terms of my journey is that um, I guess I've always been really fascinated about how you use um, technology um, to I guess take engaging people with social issues to scale. Um, I, I'm always thinking about the big picture, and I'm always interested in how you do things at scale and. Um, doing a lot of work around online campaigning and online tools and technology has always been part of that. And I spent some time in the US a couple of years ago um, uh, kind of to research that further. And um, it was then that I met um, a um, guy who at the time was the head of an online team for Obama's, um, uh, for Obama. Uh, and uh, we were talking about all sorts of stuff that was really interesting. And uh, we've stayed in contact. And when I was finishing up, um, I kind of have stepped back operationally from Live Below the Line now, um, and I kind of continue to advise strategically, but not execution-wise. Uh, and when I was thinking about the next steps, um, uh, he had kind of moved positions and was now part of this organisation called Change.org, which um, is a social enterprise um, which is really taking off in the US, and asked me if I'd set it up here, um, if they, um, you know, helped me with some money for hiring and all of that kind of thing. So. Uh, I said yes, it's a really exciting opportunity and um, you know, change.org, the best way to think about it is um, it's a platform for social change in the same way that YouTube is a platform for videos and eBay is a platform for auctions. Our ambition is to empower anyone, anywhere to start, join and win campaigns on the issues they care about. Um, and so we have about a thousand campaigns started on the site every week. Um, uh, and it's all kind of people targeting everything from, you know, a, my puppy's been taken to the pound and I don't want it to be put down, to um, an international human rights issue where, you know, people are getting um, their human rights abused in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, so that's seeing enormous growth and it's got a really great business model behind it that's empowering that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so that's kind of, I'm in the startup phase of that. I started that a month ago and I'm hiring a team and I'm, um, finding an office and it's all the kind of fun things of starting something from scratch. Mm, sounds very interesting. The um, Just interested in the Live, the Live Below the Line campaign mm -hmm. as you were pulling it together and planning and kicking it around, once you decided you were going to do something and take it and, and launch it and run it as a what was obviously a very successful trial, had you looked around at any other recent, there's a number of other recent be it a bit fast or be it a moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think like, I'm to say which of those, or did you have your own plans from scratch to say, right, we'll do it? We did a few things. So I, I'm a big believer in, um, you know, you, you can kind of find out almost anything by just like, you can learn so much just by looking around at what else is out there. Um, and so that was kind of one of the first steps that we did. But, um, and, you know, everything from, uh, what kind of taglines you use for peer to peer fundraising campaigns and, um, you know, all of them. Uh, and you won't have noticed this, but all of them um, are about getting over the, the barrier to participation. Um, so Movember, like the barrier to participation is like no one likes dirty modes. <laughs> um, and so all of their branding and messaging is all about like um, actually framing moustaches as luxurious, as something that's cool. Um, Leukemia Foundation, World's Greatest Shave, the tagline is be brave and shave. Um, it's all about getting over that hurdle of actually I don't want to shave my head. Um, 
and you know, so it goes on. And so there's an enormous, you can, enormous amount you can learn actually by analysing what else is out there. But I guess um, I very quickly felt that there, it was actually a space that was desperate for some innovation um, because uh, I didn't feel like anyone was doing it particularly effectively. There was a standard model of doing it, which is like give people some fundraising pages and wait and see what happens, or and, you know, and empower them to go out to their supporters. But I didn't feel that anyone was taking the time to really build community, um, to kind of connect people, not just with their friends and family, but with each other. And so you could have a real sense of people doing things together. Um, and we didn't really get a good chance to do that in the first year. Like, it was just about getting it to market, like, and getting it out there. But, um, and I guess that's one of the learnings is like, I, I'm a big fan of just, you know, iterate, get something out there as fast as you can, um, see how it works and then make it better. Don't try and make something perfect from the word go, because then in the second year, um, we invested a lot more into really um, building up out some of those tools and some of those strategies, which I felt um, were really lacking in many of the other campaigns out there. Mm -hmm. So the Live Below the Line campaign and Change.org, are they in any way complementary? Would you use in the future Change.org as a platform for campaigns like Live Below, Live Below the Line? Is um, that how it would be used? Not really, um, because um, Live Below the Line, I think, is, is really about changing people, but also fundraising, and, and Change.org is really about political and advocacy change. Okay, not so much fundraising campaigns yeah. as such. Yeah. But just We've done that in the past, yep. but one of the, yep. Change Org has done that in the past, but one of the things we learned is like, just keep no. it simple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. good. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, conscious that Amy's been waiting very patiently over here, and all, but, but Amy's probably the, one of the example up here that's integrated at this stage for, more heavily for profit and social purpose into her business, into the business model, which has been a number of years in from seed concept idea through to now official launch, I gather, 18 months ago. And Tom, organic tampons, of which I've been kindly given a packet and I'll put to good use at some stage, probably over the next month. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry about that, it had to be said. <laughs> but um, um, very interested, Amy, uh, in learning a little bit more about your, your journey and in particular for a singular focus and a singular passion around a particular product um, that is obviously a very well established product out there on shelves in marketplaces that people buy all over the place, but a particular view on how you wanted to change it and approach it and, and pursue that from idea and vision all the way through, if you can talk a little bit about your idea and journey. Sure. Um, hi guys. Um, I actually studied here at RMIT at the entrepreneurship degree and um, the journey the journey started there but I think when I sit back and reflect I think it started a, a long way before there. Um, I grew up in a family with um, a small business running literally in throughout the family the whole time so it's you know you can see that there's from the beginning, there's no recipe, there's no right, what, right or wrong way of doing things. If you have an idea and a desire to do something, you just make it work and happen with the resources that you have. So I think that was um, something that I always um, really connected with. And, you know, from the age of six, I remember just like making bracelets and sitting at the front of my house and just, you know, giving them to people even. And that, that whole concept that I can create something from nothing to, to to do better it was, um, I think, something that was really strong all through my education. And when I got to Year 12, I remember I was just saying to you earlier, I said, um, you know, a teacher said to us, I was studying graphic design, and she said to us, go into your local supermarket and just start to get a feel for what's going on. You know, what feels right, what feels wrong for you. And I was standing there looking at the tampon shelf, going, you know, there's there's 20 different packets here, but you peel all the packaging away and every brand is the same. And not only that, you know, I started to look at, you know, what was inside those packets. And, you know, this didn't start with a passion for tampons for me. It started with, you know, I can get out of it, I want to do tampons one day and I love them. It's, for me, it was about, you know, I've always been quite health conscious about, you know, what I put inside my body and, you know, the way that I live my life and tried to, to be better as the organic trend, um, grew as well at that similar time the whole food stores the macro health food stores were starting to grow so it was a it was an interesting time where i was it was six seven years ago um so you know i i was looking at these ingredients and i was reading you know plastic polypropylene viscose rayon synthetics you know women use over 12,000 15,000 of these things over a lifetime that look white and cotton but they're not and i felt you know there was a real frustration for me um 
particularly because it targeted such a young audience that you know women are generally quite loyal to this product and it's I just felt it was wrong it didn't feel right so I was 18 and I was like right I want to start a tampon company but that's just better than what's going on at the moment so I researched and organic cotton to me made complete sense and you know it's from the whole cycle of the product so not only to to the end user but also in production I mean there's a huge amount of toxic chemicals that are sprayed onto cotton it's you know the world's steadiest crop so um, from that perspective and then to the end user and then to the disposal of the product too that you know we don't think about you know, the thousands the millions of tampons that build up in landfills every year so that's where it started that's what got my attention it's you know and, and I believe that's also the same philosophy for the brand now too so it, yes it started with a tampon and that's really the core of where this story began but um, it really is uh, our, our dream is to develop this brand that is like a gateway to living this way so yes a tampon it gets your attention because it's the most instrument part of our bodies but at the same time you know it's possible to live this way throughout the rest of your life so you start to think about the food you put in your mouth the product you put on your skin you know and it's it, it's sort of made sense so to go back to the journey um, the entrepreneurship degree for me was an amazing forum to research and then have time to develop um, a lot of new products to market generally rush because there is that sense of urgency because it's so unique and there was that but at the same time it was like right if we're going to do this right we're going to do it once properly and I definitely agree with you in the sense that sometimes it's better to get things out there than to get it perfect which is totally what we did um, but things evolve and, and grow along the way and you know and I think you know, people say, when was that light bulb moment? And I think really the penny dropped when, I want to share this story. Um, you know, we developed the product, we got it to market, and there were so many layers to that too, which we can talk about after. Um, but it, it was an amazing journey so far. But I think it really all came together and made sense and made me, made me realize, like, this is so much bigger than just putting a product on a shelf. And it always was, but it, it needed more direction. Um, we were sending product to a fashion show in, in Sydney. It, you know, it had no meaning behind it. We just wanted to get the brand out there, but it was obviously a brand that was doing better, good, better things than anyone else's. Um, anyway, the lady who was serving us there, she said to me, oh, what are these? We have our little samples in like triangle shapes. And I was like, they're tampons, but just, you know, go and have a look at them afterwards and, you know, read about it because we're in a long line there. And she said to me, they're organic right and I said yes and she said well I'm allergic to plastic and she showed me she got a piece of sticky tape and she rubbed it on her skin and her skin was red and she said to me I like I'm 40 years old and I have not been able to use tampons or pads for my whole life so I get my period and I I'm on a holiday I can't swim like you know there's a, a real loss of freedom there and that for me was like wow you know if this is what this plastic and this product is doing for you you know just because all the other women out there don't have allergies it's just it just it didn't make sense so it comes back to that whole way of living ethically but at the same time delivering a product that is easy to find and, and, and in that there is a bit of a struggle because you're dealing with retailers that might not be um, geared that way um, but there is an amazing change coming through there are so many phenomenal brands that that are sustainable and, and doing this sort of thing in this space and 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 it, it's a really beautiful industry to be a part of so that's quite rewarding on a day-to-day -day <coughs> basis but yeah there's so much more but i must say so I, i've um god it said is one of my maybe it's probably a lifetime goal then i've been it's probably the first time i'm stating it publicly but our our large retailers and the, mm. the two in particular that we do a lot of our grocery shopping through i think hold a lot of power in what they choose to put mm. on the shelves mm -hmm. and the choices they uh, make around mm -hmm. how which suppliers they deal with and how those suppliers can uh, organize themselves and yeah. how they can incentivize suppliers mm -hmm. to organize themselves and their supply chains to support um, a more sustainable way of living mm -hmm. and I don't know that they fully have a pre well they probably very they are very aware of the power that they hold but their opportunity to turn that around and use that for the good mm -hmm. um, to if it's supporting innovative young companies like yours in the first instance or at least how your technologies and your ideas can then be scaled across mm -hmm. into other competing products so mm -hmm. the majors start to shift as well mm -hmm. but I'm very interested in talking about that part mm -hmm. with you because you've gone from scratch from innovation idea to need to source um, develop the product 
who manufactures it? Mm. How do you control that manufacturing? Mm. Is that something that you own and can own and control, or did you bring that in house yourself? Mm. Um, or uh, do they are they now in a position where they could uh, contract manufacture for somebody else based on all of your hard work? Mm. How have you managed to think through all of that, and what sort of advice around you have you had as you've worked through with your ideas? Mm. Um, what sort of professional advice have you had around and read some of the say IP or trademarks or keeping control of what's important to you. Okay, so I'll start maybe start with the supermarket thing. So we actually um, initially when we thought, okay, so ha I thought I always tend to say we because there is an amazing support team behind it um, now. But when I started, it was it was really it was family, it was mentors, it was you know everyone banding together like we all say. That's generally the way things things happen, and they and they happen at a real level. So we thought, okay, so how do we get this out there? It's it's you know, it, it's, is it a quantity game? So I initially started by meeting with retailers and, you know, I found through that process that that was just so the way that they were dealing with smaller retailers, smaller companies, particularly one that was organically minded, that wasn't the conventional norm and was at a high price point. It, it didn't work with the ethics and the reason why I created this. I mean, day to day, did I feel I wanted to be working for a supermarket? Was this the way that I wanted to see the brand delivered? Or did I want to create, and well, it pushed me to realise that I wanted to create um, an amazing community and a following behind the brand. And the intention wasn't to get it into the supermarkets. It was to put it in the hands of women who are looking for this kind of product. And um, so we've taken a step back and it's amazing because we're building these phenomenal relation relationships with these green grocers around town. And the people that we're meeting and, and the stories that we're hearing are just so real. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's possible to do both ways, um, but I think for us the bottom line is ease of purchase, convenience to be able to find a product like this, um, which is why we're also be pushing a huge focus online and door-to-door and, um, -door delivery of tampons is something that we're, we're working on. Um, we think that's in a really, a really exciting space and it's not just tampons, it's, it's everything. And again, it's coming back to that that gateway, that education that, you know, you come to us initially maybe because of the tampons mm -hmm. and the trust and the relationship we've built through there, but here's a suite of other amazing products that you can be filling your bathroom with, filling your home with, you know, non-toxic products for women that, you know, that's our big picture vision, exciting. So you're particularly keen in keeping the brand and keeping ownership of the brand and around that community rather than saying what we're doing could be expanded in scale and still achieving the same mm. difference, but you lose control over the, the brand. Mm. The example yeah. I'm thinking of would be, uh, and of course, macro, macro whole foods markets was a great starting point mm. for a lot of uh, um, organic and, and, and uh, more ethical products. And of course, always came along and snapped it up. And increasingly, they're still keeping a lot of that authentic, mm. but their um, contract manufacturing of that brand with a lot of that type of things. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, the intention for all of this has always been it's a real product, it's a yeah. reflection of everything that I've always believed in. and. Um, you know, when you get to a certain stage in business where we have found that you really do need to take the plunge a little bit and grow, and to do that is for us has been able to find a phenomenal team that share in our vision to, to make that happen. Um, so that's, I believe, as far as it's going to go in terms of giving away that control. Um, we've got like-minded people who who are sharing in to create that. Well, but it's it's not going to be in any sense. It's it, this is the beauty of this, the most beautiful part of the journey. I think, and I hate to use that word, but it'll be when we can actually sit back and realise that we have created change through the lifestyle purchase of these, you know, FMCG products that, you know, generally have not much care factor, yes. but yep. um, can have such a greater influence and effect on so many people, so many ways. A, a question that I'll, th I'll throw open for, for all of the panel. Actually, mm. been interested in, in your case in the first example, was there ever any point along that journey where you thought, okay, no, nah, I've had it in, I've had everybody in my ear along the way to mm. say it can't be done or we need to do it this way or, 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 or it's, it's not going to work, it's not going to scale, we won't get the success. Mm. Um, did you ever, were there any points where you thought, no, that's mm. it, I'm going to stop and do something else? And if there was, what, what shifted you back or what kept bringing you back to stick with the vision? Mm. So it's an interesting question because there were like, and there will continue to be many, many challenges with this. People say to me like, tampons, like, does that make you excited to get out of bed every day? You know, it's, and I've tried to explain it's a lot more than that. But um, no, there's never been a time where I 
this wouldn't have continued and, and followed through with the vision that I've always had for it. And I think persistence has been the biggest key to that. Um, yeah, there's, you know, it's generally take two steps back before you take a step forward, but, um, you know, it's, you learn some really hard lessons, particularly in the start phase, because you're so sensitive. There is, there is pretty much no budget and you're making much with little, but I found, um, to surround myself sometimes with people who, yes, they share your vision and they're supportive and they might be mentors or your family, whoever else, but it's also important to have those people around you who are not just yes people. So um, I found it was a little bit healthy to have those no people yes. sometimes yes. because you really respect and trust that mm -hmm. and, and I think that helps to make what you're doing ultimately better. Um, so I thought that was positive too. But no, there was never a time where I was been seven years before it was even on the market. So. This, this was always going to happen, and and yeah, there was no question. That's um, congratulations for sticking out at the seven years to getting on the market in such a way that's obviously so far leading successes that you you've set for it. And I can see the spark already, and from our earlier conversation about where you see you'll take it with some other complementary products and things like that. So, mm. and it sticks to the same philosophy, and you can create that community around it. It's another good example for how other people can be looking and, and hopefully inspiring some ideas out here to go for a wander around the supermarket and see what can change. Actually, ideas can come from strange spots. I was chatting to a fellow the other day who's in a um, household personal care in, environment as well, supplying the supermarkets, and uh, he's one of our Entrepreneur of the Year finalists this year. So I'll, I'll give him a free plug, Nature's Organics, which has the um, Earth Choice brand of dishwashing and goods and a range of other things and talking to him about various businesses and ideas and stuff like that. He says, I've got loads of different ideas and different things of where I'd like to go. And then he threw one at me that caught me completely by surprise, which was dog food. I thought, where do you go from thinking about household and personal care to, to dog food? And he says, do you realise how much salt and preservatives and all of this sort of stuff goes into what we're putting down our pet's throats and things like that? He says, it's just, we're starting to spoil them like children, but um, we don't actually sometimes think that next step and go down that path. So I thought, you know, he's just very focused on that type of thing. And so once you've got that passion and that drive and that team around you, it's amazing how you can take it in other directions and still achieve that thing. So good luck. And you're just so much more aware of all the other issues and the other things that are going it's, it's almost contagious it's, yes you know and it's yep. in a good way yep and, and if you can get your organization and everyone around you thinking that way the opportunities of where you can take it and i think mm -hmm. you were talking before recycled packaging and your the, the so the uh, also interested in, in navigating the uh therapeutic goods act mm. requirements and that sort of mm. stuff did they bat you away for a while oh, to say go away go mm. away go away at what point did they start to take you seriously that you mm. had a product that you wanted to take for? That was quite a frustrating process because there's no guidelines for organic tampons, it's only conventional tampons. So we were still, even though um, the benefit of using an organic tampon is that it, it really does remove the risk of contracting toxic shock syndrome, we still have to put that guideline on our pack, which is very frustrating. So we were sort of pigeonholed into the conventional, yeah. Um, it took months, um, but uh, and, and one of the biggest challenges to overcome was that, you know, and I was saying to you before, we're continually working out how we can remove that plastic on our packaging because that is something that really bothers me. Um, it has to be tamper proof and tamper evidence. So there are those sorts of things that, like I say, it was important to get a product to market to put it in women's hands, but at the same time, it's not perfect yet. Yep. We're constantly evolving and, and trying to improve what we're doing, but um, no, we persisted with it and, you know, and, then we and they were great to work with. Uh, Amy, you were chatting at the beginning about uh, how your family background and, and parents and family with small business background had you thinking from a very early age on potentially um, knowing that you could make a difference and do things in whatever field um, you have. Just interested in, with the other panel members, um, any comments on your own backgrounds and upbringings and circumstances and how that may have prepared you for or, or informed your choices towards the social enterprise space? Alrighty. I guess um, my upbringing is I'm adopted from Sri Lanka and um, growing up my family from a very young age I was always out there with the family um, at markets raising money or doing trivia nights for the orphanage that I came from so I think I knew from a really young age that you could do little things that would make a big difference um, and yeah it's just always been a value of my family to be doing that. Um, Definitely no business backgrounds though. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's been a very big learning experience, that side of things, but I think you know, the ethical side and the value side is yeah, 
And Elliot, there's some obvious influences probably in, in your family, but um, what do you, in reflecting on your own Are you talking about my mother? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, there are. Um, well, I guess the, the secret is that my father, Tim Costello, not really secret though, I don't mind it. My father, Tim Costello, from World Vision, um, which by virtue of his brother makes my uncle the former treasurer, um, Peter Costello. So it's nice two sides of politics there, so I'm pretty well balanced mm -hmm. between both. Um, but. I mean, I'll, I'll be very frank, I don't think um, anything that Dad did, or um, even my mother, who's a director at a local charity called Urban Seed in the City, um, anything that did by way of teaching me, um, sort of guided me on this road for why Gap and everything has prevailed, it's uh, more implicit learning, and um, by virtue of their passion, their work, their vision, um, not just on a global scale, but from Dad's work with uh, when we grew up in St Kilda, working with a lot of the disadvantaged uh, people around St Kilda, and then that extended across to national and global issues. Um, you do learn a lot from uh, what they're very, very driven by. Um, so that's really, I guess, to a degree, guided myself and my brother, who uh, are both very socially minded. Um, but in saying that, my sister couldn't care less about volunteering. And um, it, uh, she has been involved actually years ago, but right now she's pretty much washed her hands and said, right, you four are involved in social projects. I'm not. I'm making money and I don't care. So it's, it's interesting. So it, to some degree, yes. There is a learning curve by virtue of what they've done, but um, and I'm quite proud to say that YGAP's been built around the network that I'm connected to, and uh, I think I've gone to Dad two or three times to ask him questions in the, along the whole journey, and part of the obvious question from some people is, oh, obviously Dad's given you some advice. No, he hasn't. Um, Kamari, a bit like you, Dad doesn't know anything about business and uh, could barely count to 10. So I like to think that I've stolen my uncle's brain with business and been able to adopt that into Dad's social vision. But so uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's an implicit learning. So you mentioned networks, and no, actually we'll, I'll come back to that, but uh, in terms of your own background, Nick, yeah, um, what's leading you down the road? My, my focus is social workers, so they, they, um, I think there's always been that kind of um, community mindedness. They were, they were they're ex hippies. Uh, <laughs> Um, is there such a thing as an ex-hippie? Yeah, they, they sold out and got jobs. Uh, <laughs> um, I remind them of that constantly. Um, uh, and so I definitely got, kind of got the values guide from them, but I think um, uh, one thing that I did want to say in that, in terms of what's influenced me most in terms of my ability to do this kind of stuff and where I've learnt most is the, is the networks that I've surrounded myself with um, here in Melbourne, because my folks are from Bendigo. Um, I'm firmly of the opinion that you're only as good as the people that you surround yourself with um, and that if you surround yourself with people that are inspiring, that are changing the world, that think that anything is possible, then you will as well um, and, and the chances are you will be able to do that and, um, you know, and I'd say to anyone here, if you're not inspired by the people that you spend time with, then find other people to spend time with. Um, <laughs> because I, I, I was just really lucky in that you know, five years ago I fell into an environment where um, I was surrounded by some of the most inspiring people I continue to know and they'd say that anything was possible and they would have a good crack at doing it and, and you know, that's just kind of rubbed off and um, you know, I think that I'm, in terms of my skills and my attitude, like my values my, from my folks, but my skills and my attitude I think is more of a product of those people that I've spent time with than anything else. So who are the people that you hold out that you, uh, that do inspire you, that have inspired you, that um, you'd like to celebrate a little bit or share with us that um, you think have been important role models for yourselves? Specific people or just the role that they played in the oh, journey? Oh, either. Would whatever. you feel comfortable so, sharing? Through the journey, I think the different people that have been involved has changed and, you know, I've had mentors all the way through, but, um, uh, no, there's been a real combination, a, a beautiful mix, and, and more recently, um, we've come to meet an amazing group of people who I didn't, didn't even dream that could exist. You know, these are people that, like you're saying, they push the boundaries to the things that are real to you in life, that it actually can be applied to business too, in a commercial sense. Um, so it's really a beautiful fusion between you know what we're doing and what you guys are doing. You know those sorts of real values that resonate with everything that I think I brought and brought up with too. So um, it's it's nice to see that that actually exists and that is real. So um, that's been an amazing new turning point in the journey. I mentioned before new phase of growth ahead for Tom. There's some new people involved that are the people that I'm talking about, and it's it's. Good. Super exciting, Good. but again, the through the journey, there's been you know there have been quite a few others involved too. But I think 
one of the things that, that a combination of those amazing and some of them are you know entrepreneurs in their own right um, others are just amazing support and believe in me as a person mm -hmm. and whatever I will do and that's nice and that's healthy too um, but a lot of them have taught me that you know no matter how much advice you can get and that's always important to learn because you can't know everything at the beginning when you start and continue to learn the whole way through is to trust your gut instinct um, and the people that you surround yourself that actually trust that too is it, I think that's just amazing you know and, and that exists and there are people out there who do so. Kamari any inspiring people in your or life and world that you or people yeah, that you um, do even today that uh, you like to emulate, maybe not emulate, but draw inspiration from. Yeah, I think um, other young people that are doing similar work has been really key to driving me forward and believing that they could do what I was doing. Um, seeing them be able to achieve things was sort of showed me that, yeah, it is possible for a young person to do something um, and create social change. But I think also um, with the young people that I work with, that inspires me incredibly and that's what keeps me going. And, some of the amazing things that they've been able to do despite their circumstances, you know, well then, of course I can do this with the opportunities, opportunities and resources that I have available to me. So that's, yeah, definitely good both ends, I guess. And what about you, Nick? Yeah, it's funny, it changes over time. Definitely there are kind of people who play roles at particular times and I've had, um, you know, my share of um, mentors, although most of them actually like to think of being on a shared journey where you're helping each other. Um, uh, one thing I have found is, um, you know, uh, kind of what I was saying before. Like uh, when I um, when I started at the Oak Tree Foundation five years ago, I um, uh, was incredibly inspired and intimidated by some people there who had been enormously successful, like um, at setting up the organisation and leading really significant campaigns and that kind of thing. Um, and it's funny how, like, you know. As I said, like you spend time with those people and you work alongside them, and at first you're like, yeah, wow, well, like these guys know so much and are so good at what they do, um, and then you know slowly but surely they become peers, uh, and yes, they're inspiring, but they're inspiring for different reasons um, after that, um, and they're kind of colleagues um, that you're working with, and so I actually, I actually try quite hard to continue finding people that I'm inspired and intimidated by, and um, putting myself next to them and under them. Um, and trying to turn them into peers, because um, I think it shows you're growing. Um, and that you know, becomes harder and harder, and you have to start looking internationally for people that you go, you now that, that this person is really kicking ass. And, um, and you know, part of that's kind of why I've taken the next steps that I have, is you know, looking at who are the best, like, you know, literally like, make a list of the best people in the world that you can find, um, and you go, okay, what does it take for me to spend like, two months with them? Which leads back to the question earlier that how you managed to find yourself just happening to have a drink in a bar with Barack Obama's <laughs> online campaign person. Yeah, exactly right. Is that an example? That, that's exactly right. I, um, I, when I was, I was doing some campaigning in New York um, around a UN summit there, um, and I was like, I'm not going to waste a good trip to the US. Um, uh, so I spent um, four weeks um, when I just said, who are the thought leaders that, um, who are the people that I think are on the cutting edge of all of this stuff? Um, and I did 80 meetings in four weeks um, and um, met with just everyone I could find. I just totally like um, poured out my networks and was like, you know, I need an introduction to this person. And most of them were like, who is this crazy Australian? Like, um, I think if I'd been from the US, no one would have spoken to me, but because I was this weird Australian, like um, I got to hang out with all these really interesting people and uh, now a lot of them are friends and um, you know, they go from being people that you're inspired and impressed by to peers that you're kind of on a shared journey with. I think I've found speaking to others, if you start that process, it's the starting that's difficult, but one contact can lead to another oh, contact. Totally. And you start to get all the dots yeah. on the page, and then it becomes easy, and it becomes habit, and it all links. Yeah. And it's, you, know, you start kind yeah. of getting like this, yeah. because there's, there's networks, like, the, and you kind of get into the network, and then suddenly you're part of that network, and you kind of introduce, yeah, it all just kind of flows into place. In this world, yes, it does. Conscious that there's probably a lot of people out in the audience with some questions for, for all of the panel or any of the panel that they may like to discuss. So I guess my question is directed at everyone, but maybe also specifically at Nick, but everyone's happy to try and answer in whatever class you can. Um, I don't know how relevant it will be, but um, I'm wondering when you have a really unique idea that's um, entering a field, um, 
that's also particularly unique. Um, I guess one option would be to look at um, other organisations or companies that are currently doing a similar thing but a little bit different. Um, and I guess um, using that as a stepping stone or a building block um, might have its advantages and disadvantages. So I was wondering, Nick, in terms of you know the benefits of oak tree with starting to live below the line. I mean, uh, that's very specific, but generally, um, is it you know is it beneficial to use other companies doing a similar thing or organisations or start just alone? Uh, either is possible. I don't think there's a right answer, but I think undoubtedly live below the line wouldn't be what it was um, if um, you know we'd kind of done it any other way. We kind of brought together Oak Tree and the Global Poverty Project together to, I guess, you know, invest into that campaign um, after we had the idea to set it up. And um, and I think you know, and that goes for me more broadly in that um, I don't think you know, for me to get to the point where. Now I'm having the time of my life setting up an organisation from scratch. Like, I, I love what I'm doing, I'm having a ball, um, and, and, and it's building from nothing. Um, but I think that if I had come, from, if, if, that was, if I was doing it for the first time, I would be terrified. I, I would have no idea what I was doing, and I would be like stumbling around in the dark. And so to come through, like personally, um, a, a process where I'd kind of been involved in setting things up smaller and then larger and then larger um, within organisations, and then um, for something like Lift Below the Line to again kind of um, have that, I think, you know. It's, it's kind of baby steps that gets you there and it kind of leaves you in a situation where you are able to um, kind of take something from scratch and turn it into something incredible. Um, but yeah, but th that's not to say that it can't be done the other way. Um, I think it did work for me that way and, um, and I'm very thankful that it did. Any other questions at this stage? I just want to ask Kumari and Elliot. I know you have projects in Africa. Um, I was born in Zimbabwe and I sort of feel like the social enterprise, um, well, the do-good area is more for NGOs where I'm from. So how can we get local Africans to sort of engage in these sort of projects and initiate them themselves? I think it's a really big one, actually. Um, I find um, we have a local team in South Africa of local volunteers and they have some of the most amazing ideas to start their own businesses or social projects. Um, but they find that they've got restrictions of not having access to you know, internet or transport or have um, training and education. So I think it's, I don't have necessarily the answer, um, but I think it's a massive area we need to work towards. But something we found in our organisation is having um, young people come and volunteer with us and gain that practical experience can give them the skills and knowledge they need to then be able to pursue their own ventures as well. So that's, I guess that's what we're doing to help in that area, but yeah. It's a good question. Um, I mean, YGAPs, we uh, work very much in partnership. So each each development project we have across Africa and Asia, we go into project partnerships with groups on the ground. So um, we don't come in with Western idealism about development. We, you know, university graduates from developmental master courses that we've got the solution to your community's problems. It's very much through our partnership organisation and they're responsible for the due diligence, the research, the setting up, the materials, uh, and we invest capital, finance, and volunteer sort of um, skilled and unskilled effort. Um, so through our partnerships, um, I've met with uh, young emerging African leaders and uh, our partnership in Rwanda, for, just to draw a specific example, is from a young guy named Dave Mumbawe and he at the age of 13, like many Rwandans, uh, escaped the country and, and fled to Congo and lived in a refugee camp after 1994 genocide and sent himself uh, with his family to Kenya and uh, ran a series of small businesses to get education and was knocked back six times before getting entrance into a high school and then got himself to university and ended up at Syracuse University doing his masters and now has just come to La Trobe to do his second masters and his PhD. Um, David now in Rwanda has just with us and Wygat, so we uh, obviously fund him and send volunteers over, but his organisations in Asia specifically builds that um, educational tool and provides that opportunity for young Africans. Um, more focused on high school and uh, primary school, but wants to provide that vehicle for people to get involved and get engaged and have that confidence um, because he's had that opportunity and that was by virtue of education and working for it. Um, 
in Ghana, we have project partnerships more based around women's sustainability, so there are micro pro microfinancing projects that actually provide that opportunity for women to uh, have that voice, not just the voice, but also that source of income um, by launching water projects and different irrigation projects within our Ghanaian project. Um, but, you know, nothing we do would ever be by virtue of, you know, what we're studying here or what ideas would come up here in Melbourne and we take to the field, it's through project partnerships. Um, and we respect our partners and we understand that they're the ones living on the ground, living in the community. They've got the solutions to the problems because it's driven by the community. Um, and we'll provide a vehicle to making that difference, which might be capital finance, which might be some skilled labour. I'm from, <clears throat> from the School for Social Entrepreneurs. Um, I have a question that, uh, Nick, you were touching on before, and it's about um, you comparing yourself to other people, successful people, because obviously we hear amazing stories here. Um, have you ever felt, maybe we can ask Tim and then um, Kamari, um, if you ever felt that these guys, I'm, I'm getting a bit too intimidating uh, by these people and it's drawn you down, if you have done that, how have you overcome it? If who's too intimidating? So if you met someone that's been in, in your environment, that's been um, intimidating, um, for you, like you feel that you're not good enough, basically. And if you have felt so, how have you overcome that problem? If, if it ever happens, it only ever happens for like the first time. But you, you meet someone, so that's what I've, what I've found, like when you don't actually get a chance to interact properly. Like if you can put yourself in a situation where you're able to engage them on a personal level and actually get to know them a bit, like it kind of just suddenly breaks down all these barriers. Because I think we have this tendency to build up people and build up institutions and kind of say, oh, they've, so they've got everything worked out and everything's easy for them and um, they know exactly what they're doing. And everyone everywhere, no matter how good you think they are, are making it up as they go. <laughs> um, and, and I think that the sooner you realise that, the easier things are going to be. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so I think, I think actually it's like, um, I think you really need to fight to overcome that feeling because I think that as soon as you don't see yourself as a potential equal, um, then uh, the conversations that you're going to have is like, oh, impart wisdom on me, oh wise one. Um, when in actual fact, if you approach it like an equal, they're actually going to um, engage with you in a lot more, much more intelligent way and you're actually going to get a lot more from the relationship. That's my experience. But. I just echoing what Nick said um, after I nearly committed suicide at Pricewaterhouse Coopers, um, and having that freedom to start our Kimfo project, and then um, in need of an income, I ended up working for a digital agency, uh, and a good friend was running it. And um, she always told me that you know, make sure you, all you need to know in life, Ellie, is make sure you know five percent more than the person you're talking to. And, uh, <laughs> and she always said her mantra is "fake it till you make it." Yeah. Um, I don't encourage you to do it, but it's worked for her, and she's a successful business person. Um, but I think. The heart of the question is, and I guess turning back to where um, the organisation you're involved in, SSE, um, and part of my inspiration stems from people like your CEO, Benny Culligan, people like Daniel here tonight, who are Australia's leading social entrepreneurs. Um, embedded in that inspiration for me is also intimidation because they've been years ahead but achieving so much and knocking down doors after door after door. And as a young social entrepreneur, you're, you're trying to, I guess, build that sort of momentum and continue knocking down the doors, but you're faced with so many challenges. Um, but I think what you need to understand is that's just human nature and no matter who you are, relevant your networks, relevant your passion, relevant your vision, like Amy's vision, it, it can be incredibly successful but you will face challenges and you will have doors. Um, but it's a matter of pushing down that door and facing the next one. The only other thing that I would add on is that um, I guess everybody faces challenges and nobody's probably got it perfect so the people up there who intimidate me, I want to create, um, have um, relationships with them and learn from them and also understand, you know, what are the things that maybe aren't working so well and how are they overcoming them and more, yeah, just see it as a learning experience and, yeah, does that make sense? I guess my question is around um, the terribly central and important issue, I guess, and Nick's talked about it a bit, you all have really, of how do you get the community to engage in a sense of social responsibility for the long term? And um, it's, I work in public relations and a, an ongoing, with an interest in all these areas, an ongoing serious issue for me is how does one bring our community, which is so self-focused and so self-interested, even though there are great people wanting to do things, how do we actually develop and engender a greater sense of social responsibility and have you all thought about engaging with education systems in the broad, how do we teach people and how do we encourage our community to be more interested in helping others in this very self-focused world. And I guess I'm also just interested in what you all see yourselves doing in 10, 15 years time. 
Um, I won't focus on the, the wider network, but more internally, how we've built a community and sustained a community is um, we don't work off a hierarchical system at all. It's very decentralised YGAP. Um, so what that means is everyone involved in the organisation owns a part of the organisation. And part of our best ideas generation come from within and it's someone coming to the organisation with a hairbrain idea, no matter how big or small, and we just run with it. Um, and part of the success is just saying that you know the sky's the limit. And the one reason we've got a viable cafe in the heart of the city is because we don't have boundaries. Um, but embedded in that is making sure that it's not an executive decision or a management decision, but it's more so just the, the grass is cool, that's a great idea, but we're not going to do it for you. You're now the coordinator, you're now got the freedom to do it. Here's your resources, your fundraising licence, um, a few volunteers to help with you, go for it. So that empowerment tool gives someone the chance to say, oh, gee, that was just an idea, I don't mean to do anything with it. Well, bad luck, and now you're involved. <laughs> so um, that, that's by virtue of just letting them own part of that idea and running with it. Um, for us, it's been different. I mean, we're, we're still trying to work it out, but we, um, we, we've made a few steps, I feel, in the right direction. And, and one of those um, major steps, I feel, has been our partnership with the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation, which is still not even properly public. I mean, it's, it's official. We've got their logo on our packs now. And we're the only tampon brand who is endorsed by them, which says, says a huge amount um, about health and women's health. And you come back to, you know, to come back to your point about, you know, people generally are so concerned about themselves well you know through our research it's it's shown that the initial thought process is well how does this product affect me um, forget about the environment put that secondary so for us it, it's health this this affects your health um, so that for us has been a step in a direction to um, share networks to um, position ourselves in a, you know, in a different light to show that you know, these are the things we care about, these are the companies we're going to support, and in turn they will support us too, which I think is a real way of, of showing women that we genuinely care. Um, we're a startup business, so, um, you know, I mentioned before, budgets are extremely tight, but from the day that we literally started trading, we were giving tampons to the Sacred Heart Mission in St Kilda and filling their shelves and bathroom cupboards and um, donating to the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation of what we can, because that was... Um, that was our way of, of connecting with our community and supporting, so, yeah. Um, I think another thing is that sometimes um, societal issues can seem so big and daunting that people often get overwhelmed and just feel like, you know, I'm one person, what can I actually do? So breaking it down and having the, you know, we work with this group of people, we're making a difference with this group of people, this is how you can help, help, uh, like, can work in that way and just, you know, we're one organisation, there's other organisations helping different communities, so that's I guess how we um, get young people involved and also telling the individual stories of the difference that the work is actually making. I couldn't agree with Kamari more mm -hmm. um, and it really speaks to why um, I got excited about change.org in the first place because ultimately um, being an open platform it's about individuals kind of taking action on the issues that they care about and um, you know so every campaign that's run on the site is grounded in the narrative of, of someone who's passionate about what they're doing. They're often personally affected by the issue and you know, it, it allows us to do things like big issues like climate change. Um, they often feel like you need kind of equally big solutions, but big solutions are so hard to engage with, just as Kamara has been saying. And so um, you know, being in a position where you can go, well, what if we could actually do tens of thousands of micro solutions? Like, you know, we're, you know one of the campaigns that we will be looking at are things like you know, a macro campaign, which is we want to put solar panels on every single school in the country. Um, but then we fill that with tens of thousands of micro campaigns where you have a student from that school running that campaign, signed by students from that school um, to, put, um, to put solar panels on that school. And, and you know, in aggregate, like, so each, each victory in and by itself doesn't kind of necessarily have a huge impact, but in aggregate you start seeing enormous enormously transformative change and so grounding things in people's personal experience and in their personal stories I think is is definitely one way that you can do that but you know I don't think there's a clear answer per se. Um, obviously some of you have uh, projects in developing countries and you have your own way to help the people there. Uh, my question is how you first get in contact with the people there, um, the people who need your help? Yeah. Oak Tree's been on a really interesting journey. Like it starts off like where we started was um, 
a person kind of travels overseas, has a personal experience of an organisation that needs help and then helps them do that. Um, where we've got to now is we've got a quite, a, quite a comprehensive development philosophy where it takes at least a year to select a new project, um, which involves uh, firstly selecting priority countries, priority countries for Oak Tree, Cambodia, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, Laos, and soon to be Solomon Islands. Um, once you've selected a project country, you then go, well, um, actually what are the needs of that country and doing a lot of analysis and research around um, what are the gaps um, and what's working and what's not, where are the players doing things. Um, from there you get on the ground and you talk to people about um, you know, where kind of different things are at and there's kind of a really big whole process and I think um, uh, you know, for a startup organisation you can't necessarily have all of that infrastructure in place, that's something that Oak Tree's built up over time but I think that's, that should be the aspiration is that you're being really deliberate about these things because I think there is an enormous amount of unnecessary duplication in the development world, an enormous amount of really well-intentioned projects that actually kind of don't do much at all or actually can be quite destructive. So I think it's something that needs to be really, really well thought through and really like talk to people who have done this kind of stuff before because often they'll be able to connect you with people on the ground and, and that kind of thing, even if it's starting with us up on the panel because I think um, it's, it's really dangerous to just kind of, um, kind of start doing things without having those conversations, I think. Coming back to the accountant in his probably one last question across the lot as well, that uh, I've been talking with a number of similar organisations along the way uh, of, uh, who may be looking to get uh, some corporate sponsorship or involvement or social procurement to support some of what they're doing or fundraising in different ways and uh, trying to uh, sometimes measure the benefit of what it is that you're delivering outside the wonderful stories that we can hear, we can see lists of achievements and that sort of stuff. But in terms of the measurement of the social impact sometimes it will potentially help the, the positive ex externalities that you're producing that might shift some people's decision making, refunding and support and scaling of some of these types of things. Is, is measurement something that has ever been considered or part of um, anyone's conversations with you or that you've thought of yourselves at this stage on? Yeah, we're actually going through that process at the moment. Um, with performing arts, it's really hard to say what like the tangible outcomes have been. We can't say that we're providing you know a certain amount of people with shelter or a certain amount of people with food. Where what we're trying to do is sort of long term and creating long term change. Um, and yeah, it's really <coughs> difficult to figure out well how do we actually show that and measure it. Um, and yes, funders do <coughs> want to know. Oh, Excuse me. <laughs> um, I need to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> um, funders do want to know that, and they also want to be able to um, say that their money is going towards this certain amount of people and having these outcomes as well. Um, so we're actually just having to move away. We're working on figuring out how we can do that, but in the meantime, it's um, helping funders to show what they do through the dancing and the pictures, and you know they can use that to. Um, have on their websites or have as in their newsletters to say this is what they funded and it's more visual. Looking so that's sort of the way we're getting around that for now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to figure out how we measure the performing outside. I'll finish on a bit more of an exciting note in terms of measurement because it is too and yeah. um, similar to Kamari, like there is like very tangible things we can measure with Bygap which is the number of classrooms we construct and medical students we construct across the developing communities. but. Another real touch point, which is a key measurement within our organisation and um, within our Kinfo Cafe project, is on the point of sale. And the point of sale at Kinfo, for those who have been there, um, you get given a, co a coffee bean um, when you purchase your coffee or your produce, and uh, well, you get to elect where the proceeds of your purchase go. Um, so we offer four projects. Uh, one's Urban Sea, which is the homeless project in the inner city of Melbourne. One's an international indigenous project with the Cafe Freeman Foundation in Palm Island, Far North Queensland. And then two Waigat projects, uh, one in Rwanda and one in Ghana. And that's the social experiment um, in building this measurement tool. Um, now, after our first four months of operation, we distributed $40,000 of profits to those four projects uh, based on consumer um, sentiment. Now, we, uh, the sort of breakdown of that was that 32% went to Melbourne, 23% um, went to our Palm Island Indigenous project, 21% went to Rwanda, and 19% went to um, uh, Ghana. If you're an accountant, you do the maths right there, Melissa. No, 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 no. But, uh, <laughs> Now, straight away you, you think, well, naturally people in Melbourne want to donate more so to a project in Melbourne, a home, supporting the homeless in Melbourne as opposed to a, a national or international project. 
But uh, the funny social experiment of it was when, after the first four months, we switched the jars around. And we found half of Melbourneans are just bloody lazy, they're putting it in the first jar. <laughs> They buy their coffee, they buy their food, they dump it in the first jar, they're out the door. Um, so now Garner's had a spike because it's got the till. Um, so Strategic place yeah. by, uh, by Wygap. <laughs> so, but I think that comes back to, obviously, the consumers that have the time and care about the product and what they're in for, which is a vision, and look on the board and read about what the outcomes are, mixed with a lot of the business people that fly in, grab the coffee and move on. So some of them you may just be another very good coffee in Melbourne to a larger part of your customer base who actually they're there for the values piece as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe one last question from me, if there's any one more from the audience, but one that was touched on earlier was maybe looking at yourselves or thinking your own goals projecting forward a little bit. To the extent that you have goals, interested if you do or you don't, but uh, yeah. the next couple of years, five to ten years, where YGAP or other ventures may be, what have, what have you all got on your wish list? Maybe, um, as well? I guess Something, when we started Maya Buya, I always had this really big vision about, you know, we would be in so many countries and everybody would be dancing. And recently, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think recently I sort of had to think about what I want and in terms of where am I going and where is Maya Buya going. I still have that vision for Maya Buya, but something I realised was that if we get to the stage where we are in so many different countries, what will be my role? Will it be really high level operations and I won't actually get to dance with the kids and be on the ground? So that's something that's changed my path and my direction is building this organisation up to a stage where I can hand it over and I can t continue doing the work that I love, which is on the ground. So I guess, yeah, that's been a bit of a realisation for me over the last few months. Um, I can't really say that I relate to Kamari in terms of I, I wish that everyone uses tampons. Quite <laughs> 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 relevant, but, um, you know, for, for me right now, you know, if we're talking, you know, big long-term goals and visions, it would be amazing to build up a sustainable um, brand in Tom that can breathe and feed, and, you know, feed itself. Um, but to use that as a vehicle to create change, and I will be sitting down with you guys after this and discussing how, because I think we, we should be using commercial product like this that does have an ethical value mm. system to create change in a mass market environment where it's not currently happening. So getting into those supermarkets and you know, really ramping up that awareness, because I think if we put enough pressure on them, and we can see already, I mean, the movement towards um, this whole space, you know, you were talking about the ethical cleaning product company before that's in Cosmoworth now and it's, it's dominating, it's amazing. So I think there's a huge opportunity to do that in that space that's currently not tapped into. And I think we, it would be amazing that if Tom was, you know, a benchmark in, in, in showing that this is a way that we can do business and um, we treat ourselves on an ethical, real level and um, it doesn't just have to be in social entrepreneurship, it can be throughout all the networks and all the chains and all the levels of business too, so. Um, yeah, my insight echoes to a degree Kamari's and that was the realisation a short time ago that, you know, YGAP's not an entity that's going to be set across every single country fundraising with development outcomes. Um, instead, we're very focused on the difference we make in our communities we work in and we're doing too much job at that. And uh, second tier to that is also the difference we make in the volunteer's life and that's providing a vehicle for people to have a social vision and enact change. Um, within my own sort of personal vision, um, first things first, I'd love to get back out of this suit and escape the corporate world again. Um, in need of an income, I return back to an advisory role, so um, I'm doing so at the time enjoying the role, but um, my heart lies with social enterprise and I'm um, talking to a number of uh, key leading social enterprises and uh, social entrepreneurs, but also brainstorming what is next. Um, we've decided internally that we're not going to replicate a series of cafes. We're not going to have a chain of Gloria Jean Kinfo cafes all across Australia. Um, one else, our interests don't like that, but it's a, it's been a large resource chain. We've loved the experience, but it's not something we want to package up and replicate. Um, but we've encouraged other entrepreneurs to take our business plan and go forth and do it themselves. Um, but we're looking at different service products, different service lines and different products and what would be our next kinfolk and continuing that, you know, passion for emerging entrepreneurs to make a difference and put their hand up and say, I've always wanted to do this, here's an idea. And, you know, we might have that resource or that other committed volunteer base to get involved. But in the short future, it will be to strategically move myself out of a corporate sphere and, and focus, you know, that business skill in a social enterprising capacity. Uh, for me, like, I have no idea if I'd got, if I'd, asked five years ago where I'd be, I have no idea now. Um, I think for me, it's it's 
um, sticking to the simple philosophy of um, be impact driven um, and kind of think about really carefully about where I can have the biggest impact on the things that I care about. Um, and um, that'll probably involve starting new things, like I'm a starter and not a finisher. Um, and, uh, and secondly, um, uh, you know, I guess, you know, in terms of where I'm going personally, like, um, everything I think about is, is scale and like how, how do you kind of do really kind of, really kind of massive um, infrastructural, like institution, like societal architecture level change. And um, that's, uh, you know, I guess why I'm excited about change.org because we're on a, um, we've got 5 million members globally at the moment, but um, we're on a trajectory to hit 100 million members within three years. Um, and, you know, being able to kind of empower that many people is something that is kind of exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just continuing to kind of think at that level um, for me and kind of constantly reevaluating, you know, is this the most impactful thing that I can be doing personally right now? Um, but before we finish, and I, I think I'm, I'm going to extend out our time by just two minutes because um, I'd like to put something back on these guys and say for one thing, a couple of final things myself. Um, before um, coming this evening, I thought uh, deeply about like what are the key learnings that I kind of took away from my um, last five or six years, and I um, really want um, these guys to kind of have the chance to share that and wanted to say a couple of things with myself as well. Um, one, it's like whatever the idea is, just get it out there. Like, just start. Like, it's so easy to just plan and plan and plan and try and get things perfect. And it just and it's just so much better to get it out there, iterate it, and make it better as you test it. Um, keep it simple and focused. Like, the most successful organisations are the ones that are, are relentlessly focused on a single kind of thing or a single way of doing things, and they just kind of get better and better at doing that, as opposed to constantly trying lots of different stuff. Um, uh, put an ask kicking team around you. Um, I've kind of said that a few times, but um, the most important thing um, in my mind is just relentless, relentless, relentless determination. Um, and I'm sure that these guys can identify with it as well, as there will be so many roadblocks. And it's like, you know, really it's a matter of who sticks around. Um, and, you know, is it, do you have the stamina for that? And I think just find that somewhere because it's the only thing that counts in the end. Because if you are determined enough, you'll just find a way to make it successful, even if it takes you however long. Um, but I'd love to hear what these guys have to say as well. Mm. I think uh, very similar to many of the things you've just said there. But, um, you know, they say that on average, an individual fails 3.8 times before they succeed. Mm. I mean, it's it's more than that. But, um, you know, I think my... I would add to that. And the only thing I would add is that think of something that can... Uh, on, on the worst possible day, imagine the worst possible thing going wrong, you've created an event and, and something terrible has happened and it's not going to happen anymore. It's got to be something, you create something that is a true reflection of everything you believe in. As close as you can get it to that, um, I think you will then know that you, nothing will get in your way. Because what you are creating is not only a vehicle for change, but it is something that resonates with all of your values. And um, I think that, that for me has been the bottom line. You know, it, it's far more than the physical product or the service or the, you know, facility that you create. It's 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 something that's real and, and meaningful to you. Um, and I think that's an amazing thing to do. Mm. That's all I mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I have a couple. Um, one would be, um, and I think it comes back to a few questions that were asked around what other organisations are doing and looking at their models and comparing your own to other organisations. And I think um, something we've learned is to really focus on what our strengths are. Um, and I think every organisation will have their strengths and weaknesses and you could spend a lot of resources on building up your weaknesses or you could direct that same energy to actually building on what you do really well. Um, one example, um, we our organisation has always looked up to YGAP because they're amazing at running events um, and we're not really. So um, we've um, pushed our focus onto, well, you know, the sponsorship, the grants, the um, other sources of funding that we can get, the performances, that's where we're going to direct our energy for now and really build that to be the best that it can, rather than focusing on, you know, why aren't we doing these events, that's where we should be going. So, yeah, just not comparing. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, and share a bit of a story, um, 
is sometimes when you achieve what you want, it can have two different effects. So um, one example is um, in South Africa, you know, our organisation is about empowering young people and getting them to be the community leaders and having confidence and feeling proud of what they have to offer. And we've achieved that and that's what we thought was, you know, going to be, that's what we're all about. Um, and then it kind of actually went in the opposite direction of being a really big downfall um, and something we hadn't thought about was um, in the community that we'd build up these kids confidence and they'd be um, got in these egos that in the community they started you know they were these sort of not a gang but they thought they were better than everyone else they weren't going to school anymore they wouldn't come home and do their chores because you know they were part of this performance troupe and just having this um, I guess you have to think a bit further on is what if are the outcomes you're going to achieve and what can you know what are both sides of that um, and especially when you're working in developing communities or with different cultures um, just having yeah thinking that out a bit because that's something we did not expect was that all these parents would suddenly pull their kids out of the program um, when we thought we were achieving what we were supposed to be so, yeah. Yeah. I'll keep my very short um, and thanks for touching on our events team um, they were retired or now in mental institutions <laughs> 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 of our events. Um, no, we do have a phenomenal events team, but um, where they put a lot of labour and love into what we produce. Um, it's not the most sustainable source of fundraising, um, but it is a, a great tool to uh, get your membership and your community engaged. Um, I think Nick, Nick basically summed up everything that yeah. I would suggest. Um, the only thing I would add is just to listen, and I think it's the one human quality that we don't do enough of, and I think it's the most powerful. Um, part of my downfall the first few years was just with that sort of internal group knowing what we were going to achieve and how we we're going to get there, but not listening to the people around us. And they're the people that are going to make that difference and make that change. So a lot of our focus has just been um, reinvested back into to listening to what people want and how do they want it and why and how we're going to do it. And that, uh, in, again, is an empowerment tool for them to stand up as leaders. Well, thank you to all four. I've certainly found that very inspiring, as I expected that I would, and uh, will come away feeling just as humble as I thought I would when I came in. But um, mm -hmm. it's been a, a very interesting conversation, and I'm sure there's a number of people here that might like the opportunity for a quiet question on the side. I'm sure I speak for all of these guys in that, like, I love it when people kind of approach me out of the blue and, and often like, and, 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 like uh, and <laughs> often buy me a drink, absolutely. But uh, no, and, and just be like, look, here's this initiative, like, you know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, and and so I think that no one should feel should hesitate to, to kind of reach out to any of us. I'm sure. Yeah, I agree. So I guess um, you join me in thanking our panel and our moderator.